more than 160 people, many of them children. Rescuers are still finding survivors beneath the rubble, with overflowing hospitals left to treat people in the streets. And a warning, this report contains scenes that you may find confronting. The aftermath of Indonesia's earthquake, the confusion and pain written on the faces of the dazed victims, many of them children. It was just after one when it struck, the kids still in school, when their classrooms collapsed around them. Dozens didn't make it. Here, parents inconsolable, holding their children in their arms, knowing nothing could be done. And here, carrying another child from the rubble, <laughs> knowing it could be too late. The quake was measured at a magnitude of 5.6 and struck at the shallow, dangerous depth of 10 kilometres. A massive jolt for the West Java township of Sienjur, the region home to 2.5 million people. Local hospitals were quickly overwhelmed. Hundreds had to be triaged and treated in the car park. I have seven children and one of them hasn't been found, says this woman. As around her, they were operating on victims by the light of an iPhone. Electricity is down, phone systems too. The local governor saying more than 2,000 homes have been damaged, 13,000 people displaced. And with 88 aftershocks so far, the situation is worsening. We'll stand ready to provide our friends in Indonesia with support as Australia always does. The tremor was felt in the capital, Jakarta, about 75 kilometres away, a city of 10 million, some having to be evacuated from high-rise buildings. Indonesia sits on the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire. So does the Solomon Islands, that 24 hours later was also rocked by earthquakes, a massive magnitude 7, then a 6, just 30 minutes later. But experts say they're not connected. They're both part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, but they're very, very different um, tectonic settings. Reports of damage to multiple buildings, including the Australian High Commission, where staff had to evacuate to higher ground after tsunami alerts, all now safe and accounted for. Chris Reason, 7 News. Well, a week after that giant wall of water, the Prime Minister has toured the flood-flattened town of Ugarra, accused by one man of turning up too late. But Anthony Albanese came bearing gifts with more money to help start the town rebuild. Landing at Ugaura, the Prime Minister touches down. Hi, how are you going, Anthony? In a town that was almost wiped out. It's a town where people want to rebuild. And today, $50,000 grants to help businesses reboot. First 25,000 of which uh, can be paid very quickly. As soon as those um, applications go in, they're processed immediately by Service New within South Wales. Days. Yeah, within days. The Prime Minister and Premier Are we gonna go together or? Yeah. meeting residents who've lost homes. All through the election, uh, you know, one of your slogans was uh, wasn't here to hold a hose. Uh, where where have you been, sir? And students who've lost schools. Hey guys. One all but gone. Oh. <sighs> Another still standing. When he walked through the gates, he said, Mrs Doyle, it looks exactly the same. And I said, I know, isn't it wonderful? But most aren't as lucky. The trouble is that not many people can afford to rebuild. Insurance premiums are either too high or insurance companies are refusing to provide the cover, claiming these towns are simply too great a flood risk. So as we build back towns like Yagara to make sure they can get insurance, we need to make sure they're built back in a waterproof way. But some things are priceless. Saved, these artefacts dating back to 1866. We have saved the New Zealand and we've saved a lot of locals. Unfortunately, we lost a few too. Isabel Mullen, 7 News. But welfare organisations know all too well at this time the enormity of the situation can begin to hit. Some people feel numb, some people feel angry and it's all valid and we, we're just kind of meeting people where they're at. Across the region, Lifeline is on the ground and here to help. And it can start with a simple meal. I was on that barbecue yesterday and we must have fed 500 or more people. 500 people who also had the chance to stop and have a chat. We're a very social species, we need connection. This sort of stuff disconnects us and anything we can do to feel connected to other people, to keep the community connected, 
will help the recovery process. The support stretches beyond Yagara, where professionals are taking the time to sit down with locals. Any issues that they have with lenders, we can talk to their banks, we can, we can help people to talk to their electricity companies or phone providers. And they're here to help sift through piles of information to receive the most basic support from the government. That process is, is daunting for anyone, let alone someone who's never, never been through the process. Wherever you turn, there are messages of hope and people to listen. Come down here and, you know, just enjoy and have a chat. There's so many stories to be told. Reminding us that no matter the challenge, hold on, pain ends. Ruben Spargo, 7 News. And if you or anyone you know needs support, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14. Travelled hundreds of kilometres to receive the best possible care. Safe in the hands of her rescuer, Kevin was safe from floodwaters around Menindee by a National Parks Ranger driving through. 100 metres or so straight down there, past them telephone poles there. Eh? That's where I found him. So I jumped out and I went back, said, well, there's something there. So I went back and um, when I got about... The 10 feet away from it, I could see it actually shaking. So that's little things alive. And I thought, oh my God, it's, it's a bloody uh, little baby porcupine, you know. Just 55 days old, it was using its beak like a snorkel. He, he'd been swimming, but he'd made it to the edge of the bitumen, but he was bugging. Kevin was then driven 100 kilometres to Broken Hill before being flown to Dubbo's Taronga Western Plains Zoo. It was organised within half an hour. And I just had to go to the airport the next day with the little one packaged up in a gravy bucket and uh, got the approval for him to fly. Today, Kevin was fed out of the hands of staff at the Wildlife Hospital. The adorable Puggle, healthy, but still getting used to a new mum. She is taking a little while to get used to feeding this artificial diet. So we need to get her drinking well but it appears that she hasn't developed any problems from being in the water. On average, the zoo's wildlife hospital receives six to 700 animals each year, and it's hoped Kevin will be one of those animals able to return home one day soon. Yeah, you won me out of it, as you can see, yeah. Hamish Southwell, 7 News. And in case you're wondering, vets originally named Kevin after the Puggles rescuer. However, later on, an ultrasound was done and it was discovered that Kevin is a girl echidna. Stephen Murphy is along. Good evening. It's normally a gentle, caring profession, but the state's nurses are now as mad as hell. Today, staging their fourth and possibly biggest stop work rally. Many in surgical scrubs, they walked off the job and marched on state parliament again, demanding a fair pay increase and better staffing numbers. From hospitals across the state, they walked off the job. Hear us, Perrottet, Western Sydney on our way! To fill the streets in protest, nurses and midwives. <laughs> demanding the government's attention. We're exhausted, extreme tired. I don't even know what a day off is anymore. Appealing for public support and getting some. I'm just waiting for a friend. But good on them. Four times they've gone on strike this year, nurses part of a troubled public sector workforce. There's no political strategy in this. This is unionists saying they've had enough and they want a better system. Better pay and improved staff to patient ratios, warning safety is at risk. This is a body bag. Let's make it real. Let's see it for what it is. But this is a campaign that today was showing its strain. How did this job I love so much hurt me? Nurses striking in defiance of an order by the Industrial Relations Commission. Today's action risking tens of thousands of dollars in fines. Emergency workforce levels at hospitals described today as life preserving. The government says it would pay nurses more if it could. As for set staffing ratios. If you didn't have the precise number of nurses in a ward, the ward may be closed. Indeed, a whole hospital could be closed. And that would have been a disaster during COVID on the edge of what could be a fourth wave of the virus. This is the fight of our lives. We're standing up for our communities and we'll do it even when the politicians won't. Today's strike has prompted new union talks with the government tomorrow. Chris Ma, 7 News. And we're... Tossing the coin at the annual Prime Minister's 11 cricket match. Ready? 
Managing inflation is becoming just as unpredictable. That's ahead. The Reserve Bank Governor warning increasing global supply shocks, the effects of climate change and a shift to renewable energy means Australians could be in for a rocky ride. We'll see more variable inflation than we have seen over the past 30 years. It's already forecast to hit a 10-year high of 8% within weeks, with food prices staying high. We believe 6 to 7% next year. Interest rates expected to bounce around to deal with the cost of living fluctuations. We have not ruled out returning to 50 basis point increases if the situation requires that. The RBA boss warning workers not to expect higher wages. If we all buy into the idea that wages have to go up to compensate people for inflation, it will be painful. So best avoid that. There's nothing wrong with the Australian workforce believing that they should have a better chance of keeping up with what's happening in expenses in this country. It's really a very difficult balancing act here, and that, of course, is one of the reasons, unfortunately, why the Reserve Bank still has to continue with raising interest rates to try and slow things down. A balancing act, economists say, risks being thrown out of kilter by the Albanese government's industrial relations shake-up. Reforms it's fighting to get through the parliament by next Friday. Well, you don't get wages moving by putting the brakes on small business. You can't get blood out of a stone. Look, real people are hurting without some wages movement. The trick is how far and how fast. Rob Scott, 7 News. Well, pensioners will be able to earn extra cash without losing their benefits. The new laws have now passed Parliament, raising the cut-off by $4,000. That brings it now to $11,800. Well, Parliament also scrapped the need for pensioners to reapply for their payment if they exceed the income limit. It's all in a bid to tackle the workforce crisis gripping Australian businesses while giving those who want to work some more the freedom to do just that. It'll be a welcome boost to the some 50,000 pensioners just in time for Christmas and the changes come into effect December 1. And Labor's $5.4 billion cheaper childcare package has passed in Federal Parliament. From July next year, the subsidy will lift from 85% to 90%. That's for families with a combined income of less than 80,000. Our future youngest Australians will benefit, families will benefit and our economy will benefit as well. The plan is to set, uh, certainly set to help more than one million families. After a terrible year of floods and rain, the nation's latest climate outlook warns there's not just more to come, but worse to come. Scientists and meteorologists are telling us now to prepare for the next weather cycle that's set to see a return of droughts and fires. Cabago publican David Allen hasn't had to go far to witness Australia's climate extremes. From his front steps, he's seen bushfires threaten his town, then floods, and just this week, wild winds. It's endless. We had the drought, we had the bushfires, we had the floods. And the biennial State of the Climate report says there's even worse to come. Every time we do a two-yearly update, we have a new series of extreme events to report on. The report from the CSIRO and Weather Bureau finds that since records began over a century ago, Australia's climate has warmed an average 1.5 degrees and sea surface temperatures by one degree, blaming global emissions raging back to record levels post-pandemic. Atmospheric CO2 concentrations are now higher than any other time in the past two million years. The report predicts more heat extremes, longer fire seasons, more droughts, sea level increases with more coral bleaching, less snow and fewer cyclones but of greater intensity. Regretfully, there are no good news in this report. As an inland wall of water moves through Condoblin today, the report also finds despite this year's relentless floods, rainfall is actually down 10% for autumn and winter. It's a complicated story for rainfall. Fewer rain events but far more intense. The report confirms Australia's disturbing temperature increases, noting that in 2019 the mercury soared past 39 degrees on 33 separate days. That's more than the previous 60 years combined. A forecast of foreboding. It's not a good way to live and it's um, a really, really serious thing. Chris Reason, 7 News. When the invitation was first sent to South Africa's president, the Queen was sovereign and still front of mind today. The pageantry customary. But the occasion 
historic. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa treated to a state banquet inside Buckingham Palace, the same as leaders before him, except for one big difference. This the King's first opportunity to perform as head of state on the world stage. South Africa, like the Commonwealth, has always been a part of my life. Earlier, he and Queen Consort Camilla welcomed the president, inspecting the Guard of Honour before a carriage procession up the Mall, the Prince and Princess of Wales travelling in the Australian state coach. A state visit is the ultimate diplomatic gift. Who is invited is decided by the British government, but the King is host, a chance for him to exercise the same sort of soft power his mother was an expert in. At an exhibition celebrating the relationship between the two countries, the speech a then Princess Elizabeth delivered in Cape Town in 1947. But my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. And it was. The last state visit here was when the Queen hosted Donald Trump. Today's affair, a visual reminder of how times have changed. In London, Sarah Greenolch, Seven News. And among those captivated and concerned by the recent flood devastation across the state is King Charles. In a message to the New South Wales Governor, Margaret Beasley, the monarch shared his sadness and support, saying that both he and the Queen Consort had been following the news and were shocked by what they saw. They passed on their thanks to those who have come to the rescue. And the King signing off, our hearts go out to you. Roads that need fixing, um, the Clergate Road um, is on that list. I, I think that's a very important road. But it's hard to call for more money when there are others doing it much more tough. Our roads uh, don't measure up to the damage that has been happening out west to our, uh, our neighbours. Kabonshire is one of the worst areas hit, making it hard to start with just one priority road. It's important that we, we uh, link these main roads uh, that link our villages together and, and the main roads that access uh, out to our shire and leave our shire. These roads have suffered more than just potholes. A lot of our unsealed roads are not passable and a lot of them remain still closed. We're told the extra road crews coming in from outside the region will go where we need to open the roads up now. Ruben Spargo, 7 News. One of those roads deemed a priority by Dubbo MP Dougal Saunders is the Mitchell Highway towards Narromine. Work is now underway on a new overtaking lane near the Winsley Lane intersection. It's a stretch used by thousands of residents, tourists and freight operators every day. It's taken some time to upgrade the major highway after it was made an election promise in 2019. There's a genuine focus on making sure that we upgrade the roads that need upgrading quickly as an emergency response. Uh, and then some of those major projects will include the ones we're seeing here, where we don't need to move these people off, off uh, these projects. Work on the upgrade is expected to take six months to complete, with the total project costing $32 million. Well, some of them are choppering out, some of them are in dinghies. Uh, and there's others who have got bricks and mortar stores, but they've been cut off from those stores for some time. While some are going to extreme lengths to get into town, others have run out of options. In the small community of Corinda, it's been 14 weeks since business owners have been able to get into their stores. Well, at this stage, I, I won't be opening the shop for any, you know, Christmas shopping or anything. And with the slow and long-lasting flood out west, it could be a wait for weeks to come. The shop say, or the stock say, um, it's just closed up and waiting for my return. Businesses are considering all options to get back on track ahead of the festive season, competing with Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales. To compete with all other onlines, you know, you sort of have to look at your marketing, look at your sales, go on sale, so then, you know, you've got losses there as well. But as each parcel makes its way across floodwaters, we're being urged to buy from the regions. I think it's more important than ever. Um, maybe a little bit of patience is required while people do get these parcels via dinghies and kayaks to the post office, but when they get to you, they'll have a pretty incredible story to tell. Hamish Southwell, 7 News. Firing 67 rockets aimed at destroying energy, infrastructure, plunging cities there into darkness. And at least three people died in attacks on Kyiv, while a newborn baby was killed in a Russian missile strike that hit a maternity hospital. Well, dozens of people have been injured when a magnitude 6 earthquake hit Turkey's northwest. 
struck about 200 kilometres from Istanbul. The impact fell all the way in the capital. The disaster struck at around 4am, cutting power to many regions and causing chaos on the streets. Dozens of aftershocks have been reported and many now camping outdoors, too afraid to return to their homes. Hello, I'm Tracy Grimshaw. Welcome to A Current Affair. It was an inland tsunami, devastating everything in its path. The flood water has subsided for now, but the recovery has a long way to go. In Yagara, they need help. Local hairdresser Amanda Mongan and local cafe owner Judd McKenna join me now. Good, good evening to both of you. Judd, how are you doing now? Hi, Tracy. We're doing a lot better than what we were. Um, things are still really tough in this town and we still do have a long way to go. Um, but overall, you can just see the community behind us. We're all here together in this. Um, and yeah, we, we are doing it tough, but that's okay. But yeah. I understand. Um, Amanda, you spent eight hours on your roof waiting to be rescued by a chopper and you're not the only one who did that, are you? Oh God, no. We were one of the lucky ones. We were slightly safer than the other people um, in the full force of the carnage. Um, you know, it was just any general flood. We were downtown helping people pack up and next minute a wall of water came and we'd moved our cars and ran back to the house, lift a few things and tried to get our kids down the back lane to the evacuation centre at the school and we nearly got washed away. And luckily our, we have a big solid house that sort of stopped the wall of water a bit. So it, it sort of rose slower. Um, and then we just realised, oh my God, it was going to go overhead. We need to get on our roof. And from up there, we could see houses moving. Uh, it was just, it's unimaginable. We really can't describe it um, unless you're here. And even the people that have been here, the aftermath to see, it's just tragic. People can't believe how horrific it was. Yeah. Judd, Very you, scary. you were, I, can, I can only imagine, I can only imagine how scary it was to sit there for eight hours. That's just an incredible an amount of time. Judd, you were, you were one of the people driving around telling the choppers where there were people stuck on the roof and this was while your own businesses were going underwater. Yeah, that's right. Um, the water just come in so fast. Um, when we were trying to evacuate uh, up the road, the water was following us up there. We just were trying to do what we were trying to do to get people to safety. Uh, it was crazy. There was people screaming everywhere. And you, wherever you looked, there was carnage. It was, it was everybody just trying to do the best they could for their... For, we know everybody in this town. Mm -hmm. um, we love this town. It was us trying to do what we could do to, to help the people um, that, that, that have helped us. It wasn't a, an if or a maybe. It's what we do and it's what we've done. Just brave, brave locals. Everywhere you look, they were, one bloke dived off our roof to go and, to go and help the neighbour. He could hear someone yelling out. You know, there was another guy on the other roof trying to send the choppers in because they couldn't see him because he was elderly at the self-care units and, yep. you know, up to his neck in water, hanging onto his door frames. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just... There, so, there, there was a lot of people. Where, wherever everybody, everybody needed help. Uh, and we were just trying to do what we do. I pulled a fellow out of the house and, and he only had the shirt mm. on his back and that's all he had. And it wasn't through the front door, it wasn't through the window, it was through a hole that had, the water had blown out of the side of his house. Mm. What do you all need now? We need we need help. We need we need funds. Um, there's a Yagara flood appeal uh, through Give It. Um, this is what this community needs. We just need that that help to get us back up and running. If we and, don't, and it's just not now. Like yeah. we we need you know months to get our houses fixed and repaired, and then we're going to need stuff to move back into them. No one's got anything. Yeah. Like it's all gone. Of course, um, there is a lot of help, and it's and people, the kindness and generosity has been incredible. I don't know how we'll ever thank all those kind people who have given up their time. You know, they've salvaged their finances to come over. They've given their finances. It's 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 truly humbling and overwhelming. And um, yes. but it's it's we need it to be ongoing because all right. it's just. Well, all right, well, I, look, I do think, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I think I have got some good news for you. And Aaron Ralph from Coles is standing off to the side there. Aaron, would you like to come in? Because I think you might be about hey, to make everyone's day. G'day. Absolutely. So here at Coles, uh, we, we love to look after our communities that we serve. And Yugara is in the heartland of our, our region out here in the Central West. And 
our teams are really, really passionate about trying to help, trying to make a difference out here. And we come out last week and we saw the devastation and uh, it was really, really heartbreaking. And uh, we dropped off a delivery of essential goods and today uh, we just wanted to go again. And we want to kick off the Yugara flood appeal with a massive $50,000 donation to, wow. to the community. Wow. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Good on you, Good on you. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Jan and Amanda, how thank will you, you so use much. that so money? Uh, on the community, uh, these people that stand behind us here um, are the backbone of the community. Um, if, if this can help them in any way possible, some goods, whatever it needs to get them back on their feet, this is what it's going to be used for. All of this stuff for these people that have lost everything. They have lost everything. Their houses, houses are floated yeah. away. They've Some got nothing. nothing left. But look at this spirit behind us. Yep. Look, you've got a great community and you will come back from this. We and do. you've just had a little bit of we help. We will. And it's it's so good to we talk will. to you. Thank you for your time tonight. And Aaron, thank you. As once again roared into life this week, it's the Challenge Bathurst bringing motorsport enthusiasts to the famous street circuit. Strapping on a helmet? and firing up the beast. Over a week's worth of motorsport action has kicked off on the mount. It's huge. I mean, it's our first Challenge Bathurst eight-day event. We started yesterday with Super Sprint, Super Sprint concluding today, regularity in the weekend. The drivers are taking it all in. It's such an experience. It's not just driving on the track, but it's the whole vibe of the area. Today, the event's fastest cars hit the track. Super Sprint is all about the fastest lap, so we've got race cars practicing for the 12 hour right through to every type of race car here. We've got about 150 in the Super Sprint. For some drivers, getting behind the wheel of a car at Mount Panorama is a lifelong dream, but for others, they've been doing it for decades. I've been back in cars, I guess, since around about 2000. I've been running Super Sprint since uh, 2016, is when I bought the car. Uh, this is about my uh, fifth year here at Bathurst. These cars are flying. It's called Super Sprint for a reason. It's a GT category. There's three other categories, very hotly contested. Uh, the hottest lap yesterday was a 205.1. We've got a 204.1 today. But for some, slow and steady really does win the race. Look, I'm 73, so I mean, look, I'm not here to win any sheep stations or whatever. It's more a case of um, coming here, having a good time, taking the car and myself all home in uh, one piece. It's just really the dream of people with a performance car to come and drive this circuit. Mac Reid Snare, 7 News. In the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison's decision to secretly appoint himself to a number of senior ministries. The three-month inquiry found his behaviour bizarre and unnecessary. And today the current PM went even further. Shining a light on a shadowy government. The actions of the former Prime Minister were extraordinary, they were unprecedented and they were wrong. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese smashing his predecessor after Scott Morrison secretly appointed himself as the head of five ministries at the height of the pandemic. He's misled the parliament every single day in which he stood there as the Prime Minister, he has misled the Australian people. Mr Morrison says he was trying to steer the ship in unprecedented times. If a minister got really sick or died from COVID, he needed to be able to make decisions in that portfolio. But Justice Bell found the secret appointments to health and finance were unnecessary because if someone was incapacitated, Morrison could have become acting minister in a matter of minutes. The appointments in Treasury and Home Affairs had little, if any, connection to the pandemic and were just bizarre and extremely irregular. It was an exorbitant grab by Morrison and Parliament couldn't hold him to account. Mr Morrison's closest ally, Josh Frydenberg, has also slammed him, calling the move wrong, profoundly disappointing and an extreme overreach. Josh Frydenberg was the chief sycophant and the chief enabler of this dictatorial behaviour. No apology from Scott Morrison today. He says his decisions were taken during an extremely challenging period where there was a need for considerable urgency, adding no powers were exercised under these authorities, except in one circumstance. They were probably the wrong decisions. 
the latter decisions uh, were a form of overreach. Uh, there's not necessarily a clear explanation. The Bell Inquiry lists six recommendations, including new laws to make these kinds of appointments public. The government has promised to implement them all. To restore the Australian people's faith in our democratic institutions. As for Mr Morrison's future, he says he won't resign. The PM is looking to censure him in the parliament next week. But for now, he gets off scot-free. Jennifer Beshwati, 7 News. Well, it was a special touching tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth following the monarch's death in September. Now, more than 1,000 Paddington Bears left across the UK in Her Majesty's honour have been donated to children after a journey with a new royal friend. Escorted in a black cab, Paddington's latest journey has taken him to a special teddy bears picnic. Delivered by the Queen Consort. Thousands of Paddington bears were left at royal palaces in the days after Her Majesty's death. Tea? Oh, yes, please. Tributes to the Queen and her Jubilee guest in a skit that revealed Elizabeth's comic timing. I keep mine in here. From darkest Peru to royal parks, through the washing machine and now into the hands of hundreds of children, supported by the Bernardo's charity. All the children here who have received one of these bears today uh, may not quite get the impact of it now, but to have that uh, by your bed in the years to come will be quite special. After three decades as patron, Queen Elizabeth handed over her role at Bernardo's to Camilla six years ago. She's made the support and protection of children a key part of her charity work. <laughs> This time delivered with marmalade sandwiches and a very special gift. In London, Hugh Whitfeld, 7 News. Flying kangaroo says Rex is ridiculous. Either way, passengers are paying the price. Rex Airlines flying high, profitable for the first time since the pandemic began, but now for a skirmish in the skies. They're charging more than twice the price for the same service. And I think that's an example of gouging and I think it... Uh, it, it, in the long term, it harms the airline industry. They say competition breeds excellence, but Rex boss John Sharp says Qantas airfares are unfair. I think Qantas is doing this because I think they can. They think that they can get away with charging people all this extra money. We checked one-way direct fares on the nation's busiest air route tomorrow. Jetstar's best, $382. Virgin, $427. And Qantas, $458. Rex was actually dearest at $489. But Qantas does have some big fares out there on December 9. Some seats are now more than $1,000, way ahead of the rest. What we're finding right now is essentially every Qantas flight is full. So therefore those very high fare levels are triggered. Today's passengers say it depends what you're into. I just think they're really good. I haven't had any problems with the service. The lines are good. And in the Rex queue... Can I ask you why you chose to fly Rex today? Ah, uh, because it's cheaper. In the meantime, Qantas has launched its own attack, saying, quote, unquote, Rex repeatedly makes ridiculous claims about Qantas to distract from its own operational failings. So, a month out from Christmas, the battle lines are drawn, but with prices sky high, passengers can't win. Tom Saker, 7 News. Well, and changes are key to solving the health crisis in the bush. For some time, local health experts have warned about this. Medicare currently actually provides less funding the more time you spend with a patient. Saying the system is outdated and simply no longer works. Medicare has not been able to keep pace with inflation, forcing GPs to do more consultations. 15 minutes is great for one condition. It's not great when you've got four or five and they're complex. Now a new report is proving that. A more than 100-page document from the Graddon Institute highlighting the need for urgent and reform in primary care. If we can get the foundations right, fewer people will end up in our acute care systems. You don't do that. You need more hospitals. They're a lot more expensive. They take up a lot more resources. The report revealing very little has changed over time. Those statistics have proven the complexity of GP work has as the rate of chronic diseases rises. Consultation um, uh, should be based on complexity and the funding should be based on that complexity as well. With an ageing population, we are going to see more people with more illnesses who are going to live for longer. Then there are other issues. Various states have pushed forward with plans to allow the likes of pharmacists to do the work that GPs are trained for. Whilst it may be a short-term fix to the workforce crisis, it doesn't provide the best quality of care.
There are concerns this will lead to greater fragmentation of healthcare and the potential for medical errors. It is really important that people have a GP, someone that they can trust, that they can go to and that they know will listen to them and will work with them with their health conditions over their lifespan. Christopher Tan, 7 News. The fight is on to get Yugara residents the long-term financial support they need. Many believe bureaucratic rigmarole is holding everything up. The community is devastated and people have lost everything. The town community itself is trying to stick together and be positive, but there's a lot of um, uh, uncertainty. Financial stress is front of mind for almost everyone. A lot of people around here um, are pensioners and, and, and they're finding it really hard with their insurance companies. 21 days on, the state and federal governments have still not come to the table. Uh, look, they've had um, funding of $1,000, which doesn't get you much, uh, obviously, when you've had everything destroyed. Locals want to see everyone in town offered some hope to rebuild their lives. The back-to-home grants um, would help in a long way for a more permanent solution, um, which is what's really needed. Those grants, the same ones used in Lismore, give individuals up to $20,000 to replace essential household items or their homes. The process needs to be sped up. Um, obviously they're waiting on some more data uh, to come forward, but I think we really should push that process and, and get it started. Seven News understands the state government is still waiting on the final data from rapid damage assessments to take the case to the federal government. Well, the rapid damage assessments don't seem very rapid to me, but I can give you one right now. Yugara is a disaster zone. A state government spokesperson today told us the government will continue working with the Commonwealth to unlock additional financial assistance for the flood affected communities. Stop writing reports and passing them around and get some money out the door to help our residents. Especially leading up to Christmas, it would be, yeah, it would be amazing for the kids and for the people just to even start cleaning up themselves. Ruben Spargo, 7 News. It isn't all bad news in Ugara, though. One thoughtful 14-year-old has dropped into town with a special Christmas surprise. Jack Byrne from A Five for a Farmer has been busy raising money for flood victims. He has topped $25,000 for the people of Ugara to make Christmas a little bit easier. The money has helped load up the Christmas trolley with presents. He has purchased gift cards from Orange's Toy World. Money is also set to go towards Ugara's community centre. Buying local could be make or break for our communities this Christmas. Shopping at small businesses is vital to keeping doors open during the flood recovery. December is supposed to be a joyous time for many, but for our business communities impacted by recent floods, they are still trying to get back on their feet. We'll do the Christmassy thing, we'll do as much as we can, but uh, it's going to take a long time to catch up. One Corinda business has gone to extreme heights to keep trading. Some not so lucky. A Forbes cafe shut until next year after three major floods in just four weeks. There is a long, long way to go um, and we need assistance with all the state and federal government departments. Today, the rebuilding effort is well underway. But it's more than the tools that will be needed. Businesses pleading with locals to shop in town this holiday season. Molong already receiving a boost. They tell me about 5,000 people attended the markets here on Friday night. Uh, some 320 kids on, on the uh, bucking bull. Doubling the town's population, every dollar spent going a long way. They came from everywhere. We were, they, and all of them wanted to know how we were affected, what they could do to help. Round and round, people filled up Bank Street. As this Friday, it's Forbes' turn. With every small town in between needing the support, though we are reminded that generosity can come in many different ways. There was a bloke came in last week who wanted to buy a sheet of plywood and he offered to pay me twice the amount because we were doing it tough. And that's how generous they are. Just keep coming back and supporting us. Businesses hoping it continues well beyond Christmas. Christopher Tan, 7 News. Summer is upon us and we're being urged to protect ourselves from the biting sun. Newly released melanoma data shows Bathurst has one of the state's highest rates of skin cancer. Today looking as fit as a fiddle, but four years ago Stephen Bassett was diagnosed with a life-threatening disease that started as a small spot. Really hadn't taken any notice of, my wife had picked it up, been on me for about six months to get it checked, uh, finally went and had it checked. It was melanoma. Doctors took immediate action, but it spread into stage four melanoma cancer. In my language, it exploded. I had um, 
cancer of the liver and the spleen and the kidneys and the main one in the brain. 95% of melanoma and 99% of non-melanoma skin cancers are caused by overexposure to UV radiation from the sun. One or two times if somebody has burnt their skin badly, it can increase the risk of skin cancer including melanoma. Newly released Cancer Institute data puts Bathurst and other parts of the Central West as having one of the state's highest burden of melanoma. 23 of the 25 hotspots are in regional uh, New South Wales. But there are some easy ways to protect yourself from the sun. Slip on a shirt, slop on sunscreen, slap on a hat, and then we've added to that seek shade in the maximum UV um, radiation hours. A small ask to potentially save your life. For that six months of treatment and the following six months uh, I was a shot duck. Stephen is currently cancer free but still requires ongoing treatment. The earlier you can get detected the better but the one better than that is be preventative. Ruben Spargo, 7 News. Under a radical new plan gas and electricity prices could be capped for up to 18 months but that will need approval from National Cabinet on Wednesday. The only sticking point right now is compensation. And to complicate things further, the Prime Minister has just announced he has COVID. The only thing going up faster than electricity prices is the energy giant's profits. This is a shared problem and it needs a shared solution. The energy companies will be asked to do their share this week as National Cabinet considers a price cap on coal and tough new regulations on gas, knowing that while families face crippling power bills, Whitehaven Coal has made a record $2.9 billion profit this year and gas giant Santos $1.8 billion. But the idea that you have uh, super profits being made at the same time as businesses are going out of business is quite frankly just not tenable. The, the premiers of two major coal and gas producing states say they'll share the burden. I want to work with them to help find a national solution. I'm happy um, to go to that table um, at National Cabinet um, with an open mind. As long as the federal government opens its checkbook with compensation for any revenue lost to price caps. There would have to be adequate compensation. I don't want to see the taxpayers of New South Wales uh, shortchange. And those booming coal and gas prices also mean booming taxes. Over the next four years, uh, the budget is looking $70 billion healthier. A revenue power load that might help cut power prices. National Cabinet was to be a face-to-face -face meeting with a dinner for the Premiers tomorrow night at Kirribilli House. Not anymore. Late today, the Prime Minister announcing he has COVID again. A routine test this afternoon coming back positive. The Prime Minister says he'll be isolating but continuing to work from home. The meeting will now most likely be virtual. Mark Riley, 7 News. It's an announcement affecting every student and teacher from primary to high school. Another overhaul of the curriculum. This one called the biggest in a generation. But critics say it's just more tinkering around the edges. The Premier was struggling to read and write today. Everybody read it with me. Creating a spectacle after breaking his. I realised that I had reversed over them and they are now completely smashed. But he was still able to focus on the skills of students, announcing an overhaul of the curriculum for years 3 to 10. We've got the best teachers, the best schools, uh, but we need the best curriculum as well. In English classes, grammar will become a core focus to help students express complex ideas and write clear sentences after years of decline. In maths, there'll be a shift to sequencing and reasoning lessons to prepare students for calculus-based courses in senior high school. Obviously a lot of detail uh, across those, uh, those two su subject areas. Details teachers will be given a year to adopt. I think it's going to make it simpler for teachers to know what it is they've got to focus on. This is the 20th tweak to the syllabus since the last election. Labor says despite that, results are still going backwards. And they're interested in tinkering around the edge, edges and re-announcements rather than the fundamental reform that the education system requires. You can't have a situation where a curriculum doesn't get reviewed for 30 years. In another change, the $500 before and after school care voucher program has been extended until January 31 to help pay for care over the school holidays. If you've got a child that's starting kindy uh, next year, you can now have these vouchers. Amelia Brace, 7 News. Where Kilometre Array will uh, well basically capture the secrets of the universe and even look for extraterrestrial life.
You're looking at the future of looking into the past. The first step of the Square Kilometre Array, the world's largest radio telescope. There are no lenses, only antennas. Allowing us to look back in time over the history of the universe and potentially see the very first stars and galaxies when they first started to shine. The array will be a spiral with three giant arms, measuring 74 kilometres between each of the furthest points, made up of 512 clusters of 256 antennas, a staggering 131,072 receivers to look back a billion years into the celestial unknown. The bigger the collecting area, the smaller the object you can see. And so again, having the radio telescope cover an area about 74 kilometres across means we can see really small detail on the sky. Construction in the Murchison Shire begins today, one of the few places in the world that has the space and, crucially, is so remote. People bring with them phones and cars and microwaves and fridges, all of which make noise electronically, which mean that we can't detect the very faint signals from the dawn of the universe. It'll take eight years to transform this barren outback into the world's largest telescope, where antennas like this will stretch beyond the horizon, unlocking secrets beyond our imagination. To even uncover extraterrestrial intelligence. If there were, say, an airport radar on a planet circling a star tens of light years away, we would be able to detect that. Looking back from the outback in Murchison, Ben Downing, 7 News. Conservative politicians in the United States are scrambling to distance themselves from Donald Trump's latest suggestion that the US Constitution might need to be torn up. The former president argues it might be necessary in order to reverse his election loss two years ago. The previous president, determined to be the next president, has lost none of his knack for shock by social media. Musing on his truth social site about his election loss two years ago, he argues overturning the 2020 result warrants the termination of all rules, regulations and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Donald Trump is out of control and a danger to our democracy. The US Constitution, 233 years old, bedrock to the oldest of the world's surviving democracies, jaw-dropping for any American politician to suggest terminating it, let alone the only Republican so far to declare he's running for president. In fact, if he wins, he takes an oath to... Preserve, protect and defend... The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. For Republican politicians not yet willing to condemn Donald Trump, his comment has backed them deep into a corner. You can't come out against someone who's for suspending the Constitution? Well, first off, he has no ability to suspend the Constitution. Secondly... But he says he's for it. Well... You know, he says a lot of things. And he has time to say many more, with two years to run before Americans vote for their next president. In the United States, Tim Lester, 7 News. They don't come much tougher than Manly's aerial skiing star, Danielle Scott, who started the aerial skiing World Cup season with a gold medal in Finland. Scott's bouncing back from a Beijing Olympics campaign that ended in tears. And in the French Alps... The gender by 19 year old Josie Bath overcame difficult conditions to win snowboard cross gold and it was Josie's first coming major down, final. I was in the lead coming into the finish I was thinking surely this isn't happening but it's just it's really cool it's a really special moment for me. Absolutely well done uh, and that is after Beijing gold medalist Jakara Anthony won her first moguls event of the season. I just can't look at those knees. Good evening. Parts of an orange school have burnt to the ground despite a mammoth effort from firefighters. A blaze erupted late last night and it took crews six hours to put it out. The damage so severe it stopped local students from attending classes today. We go now to reporter Ruben Spargo who is at Glenroy Heights Public School tonight. And Ruben, those were frightening scenes we just witnessed. Maddie, this was an emergency which completely shut off this street last night. Where I'm standing right now, there was a hive of activity as authorities tried their best to save what they could. Uh, tonight, uh, th this scene looks completely different to how students left it. A ferocious blaze lighting up the night sky, neighbours sounding the alarm. 
emergency services arrived at Glenroy Heights Public around 10pm last night with red and blue lights filling the street. Fireys forced entry... <laughs> ...running towards the danger. The fire taking hold of the main building, the golden glow attracting a crowd of onlookers. We came out the front and the f it was just uh, amazing flames everywhere. They watched on helpless as the school came crashing down. We're right across the road from the school so yeah it's pretty scary. And getting this inferno under control was no easy task. It took till early hours of this morning before they could actually make sure the fire was fully extinguished. I believe they didn't leave till about 4am this morning. And the damage soon became clear. The fire leaving a gaping hole in the heart of the school. I was uh, ex-pupil of the school when I was it, I was really devastated. It looks like the fire's been contained pretty much to the administration block with lots of damage upstairs in the library. Students came to school this morning before being turned around and sent home. Only investigators were allowed past the blue tape, tasked with sifting through the evidence. We are treating it as suspicious until we've proven otherwise. An investigation has been launched. If anyone has any information, they can come forward by contacting Orange Police Station or by contacting Crime Stoppers as the school community begins to mop up with only two weeks left on the school year. Yeah, terrible way to end the school year. Ruben, do we know when kids can get back into their classrooms yet? Maddie, this is usually a time for students where they begin fun activities as they wrap up their final turn, term. Rather, However, Glenroy Heights families have been told this afternoon that the school will be closed again tomorrow. Learning will happen from home while the site is assessed and safety can be ensured. Earlier this morning, I saw one little girl being comforted by a staff member of the school. I heard them talking about replacing books from the library. We're also aware the school is weighing up their options to provide temporary solutions, solutions rather, such as installing demountables. The school has thanked the community for their ongoing support and understanding. Thanks for the update, Reuben. Reuben Spargo reporting there for us tonight in Orange. Millthorpe's annual Christmas markets have returned. They created quite the buzz around town with something on offer for everyone. The sun beamed down, visitors were invited in with open arms. Welcome to Millthorpe! Proudly hosted by the Millthorpe Public School community, it takes a town to pull these markets off. Me and Lucy have been on the drink stand for Year 6. It's a whole community involvement, uh, almost entirely volunteer based. Um, so it's great to be able to bring a positive uh, vibe to the town. They have something for everyone, from jewellery to mosaics. These markets even catered to mad sport lovers. There were items unique and summery, and there were things to smell. Whether it was living or reincarnated, there was a large group of storeholders that are homegrown. We also invite storeholders from other areas uh, to provide um, great shopping experience. As locals and visitors soaked up the atmosphere... <laughs> They each found something that tickled their fancy. Probably shopping for new stuff. <laughs> the food. They're considered some of the best markets in the state and sometimes the excitement can be too much. The ice cream! Ice cream! Organisers believe a record crowd rolled in over the weekend with the proceeds raised going to Millthorpe Public School. Ruben Spargo, 7 News. Amongst the surrounds of McCaddy Park, local talent performed all the songs we know and love. Organisers believe it was the biggest crowd they've seen in a long time. It was also an opportunity to pass the bucket around for the Forbes Town Band, raising $1,000. They lost their whole band room. They didn't lose any instruments because they were prepared, but they lost the band room. So that, that'll go towards um, fixing the floor and the carpeting. Santa Claus even had time to stop and make a visit amongst his very busy schedule. 20 locals hit the road for a 15 kilometre time trial race, getting some time in the saddle ahead of the holiday season. Perfect time trial conditions. Basically for a time trial you want no wind and um, nice temperature and today it's just absolutely perfect. For some of the athletes the race is a sprint. Our slower riders will do it in about 35 odd minutes and even some of our fastest will go possibly around the 20 minute mark. Sprinting 15 kilometres isn't for everyone though. Some riders taking a different approach. I hadn't done a time trial for a while so just to, to ride a, a good steady pace the whole way and 
um, try and try and keep the pace even throughout the, the time trial. The Bathurst Cycling Club is nearing the end of a successful 2022. Since COVID, look, we did have a few breaks obviously during COVID, um, but we've raced as much as we can. But this year's been a great year for the club. Um, we've had quite good attendances and um, trying to build on it all the time. The time trial produced some tired legs and sore Bathurst bodies. It's always good to finish. I think it's a, every time you go out and ride and race, it's a challenge, um, but it's an enjoyable sport. Nick Barrett was the fastest male rider with a time of 21 minutes and 35 seconds, while Fran Walker was the fastest female, finishing in 26 minutes and 44 seconds. But sometimes it's about more than numbers. It's not all about racing, it's about being here and having fun with your friends. Macreth Snare, 7 News. <laughs> it's lucky the season for entertaining coincides with an abundance of food hitting supermarket shelves. Uh, it really is the, the right type for consumers to load up their shopping trolley with plenty of fresh produce. Not only is it good for your health, um, but it's also you know, supporting local growers. The industry says now's the time to stock up on lettuce, spinach, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, broccoli, cauliflower, avocados and mangoes. But supermarkets fear the summer could be the final hurrah for shoppers. Before the belt tightening begins, as kids head back to school and Christmas credit card bills roll in. Woolies warning. This year it's a bigger tipping point than usual where we think our customers are going to stop talking about value and acting on value. And Coles playing it straight. Our strategy in the new year won't change, which is providing great value on the staples that customers buy the most. We are starting to see the challenges of not only uh, higher borrowing costs but also inflation. Uh, and then falls in the values of people's homes, that's starting to weigh. Growers are still grappling with sharply higher production costs than before the pandemic for everything from fertiliser to fuel. But they say that increasing adoption of new technologies will lower those costs over the longer term. If we can reduce the cost of growing vegetables, uh, then that will um, have flow-on effects for the consumer as well. Gemma Acton, 7 News. Capsule into the moon's orbit and back half a century after the abandoned lunar program. It splashed into the ocean off North America this morning and it's the first major step in retracing Neil Armstrong's historic footprints. There it is. High over the Pacific, America's new ticket to ride to the moon and beyond. Putting the brakes on a re-entry mission 32 times the speed of sound. Splashdown. NASA's Orion capsule off the coast of Mexico, ending a 26-day, 2-million-kilometre orbit of the moon. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific. The Artemis 1 flight was unmanned. Mannequins and sensors strapped to the capsule's controls inside. A deep space stress test for a planned 2024 crewed mission to the moon and then beyond. We go back to the moon to learn to live, to work, to invent, to create. Mars is NASA's Artemis endgame and today's giant first step, 50 years to the day since Apollo 17 astronauts became the last humans to walk on the moon. I was strolling on the moon one day. Three, two, one. Four false starts on a Florida launch pad last month and a severe budget overrun threatened to ground the Artemis program. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. The world's most powerful rocket eventually travelling further into space than ever before. It's return to Earth, a major leap forward and a major relief. Splashdown. It is the beginning of the new beginning. In the United States, David Woodward, 7 News. We begin tonight with the town of Walgett still struggling to understand how a beloved school principal could become a heavily armed cop killer. Nathaniel Train was a popular teacher at Walgett Community College Primary School until he resigned after a massive heart attack last year. Now he's known as one of three people who gunned down police officers in an ambush on a Queensland farm. 7 News reporter Bill Hogan has been in Walgett. Good evening to you, Bill. Good evening, Matty. Well, this small country community is still trying to process the shock of yesterday's disturbing news that Nathaniel Tran, the former principal of Walgett Public School, was one of the gunmen near the horrific ambush that killed two constables in regional Queensland. Nathaniel worked at the school for 18 months before a heart attack in class led to him stepping down in August last year. 
In May, the New South Wales Parliament heard the 46-year-old send 16 emails over two weeks demanding the Department of Education address and assist with the challenges faced at the remote learning facility. Locals and parents who knew of him were in disbelief that he died a murderer. In his career as a teacher, he only ever offered support. I thought they were talking about the wrong person. I don't... I didn't think a school teacher with the compassion that he had for, for children and, well, we live in quite a difficult community with, you know, violence, drugs, alcohol um, and the lack of resources could actually do something like this. Oh, yeah, well, very shocked, especially, uh, you know, we're so close to home and... Uh... His family last heard from him on October 9 and December 4 he was reported missing. Queensland Police acting on inquiries led to the deadly shootout that claimed the lives of Constables Rachel McCrow and Matthew Arnold as well as neighbour Alan Dare before police shot dead Nathaniel, his brother Gareth and partner Stacey on Monday evening. Counselling is still being offered to parents and students at the school exactly as to the motive of this deadly shooting, maybe months or years until we know for sure. But one thing is for sure is that people in this community are trying to work out how a warmly regarded principal died a cold-blooded killer. Buses will replace trains between Lawson and Linden for days to come after a derailment earlier today. Ruben Spargo is on Orange for us tonight. And Ruben, what happened on the Blue Mountains line? Matty, the train left the tracks just before 5am and caused significant damage to track infrastructure between Lawson and Linden, which will take some time to repair. As a result, 20 buses have been sourced to replace trains between Lithgow and Springwood. There are also three trains operating a shuttle service between Katoomba and Lithgow. We know that Transport for New South Wales are assessing that damage and actually looking at what needs to happen as part of the clean-up and to be able to get that track operational again. The train has been righted, but transport bosses can't say when the line will be open again. Travellers using the Blue Mountains line should expect delays or extended travel times. Thanks for the update, Ruben. Ruben Spargo reporting there for us tonight. From Sydney into the Central West, if visitors don't take precautions. The stunning Mudgee region is home to some of the oldest and finest wines in the world, but a tiny insect is threatening the future of them and other vineyards across the state. If phylloxera was to occur in any of those regions, it would be extremely devastating. Phylloxera are these small aphid-like insects regarded as the world's worst grapevine pest. Feeding on their roots, it could take up to six years for vines to die after being infested. The cost incurred to be able to, to have to replace most of our vineyard um, would be nearly unbearable. Easily moved, the insect can be transported by clothing, footwear or machinery. It's prompted the rollout of 65 new visitor warning signs across wine growing country after detections were made in southwest Sydney and Albury. Ensuring that we minimise the chance of spread of phylloxera out of areas that it already has a foothold. We do need to make sure they're thinking about what they're doing uh, and also for, for, for travelling in other regions. Some of these vines are nearly 50 years old and if phylloxera spreads, vineyards are faced with a daunting task to restart the plantation. It really is between four and seven years until we get uh, actual fruit from, the, from those new vines. While phylloxera doesn't impact wine quality, the devastating insect is another biosecurity front officers are dealing with. Hamish Southwell, 7 News. The future of a high-rise private hospital will be debated at the Bathurst Regional Council tonight. The five-storey centre is sharply dividing the city, with advocates saying it will change the CBD for the better. A vision to change the skyline of our city and the streets below. It will reinvigorate and revitalise the CBD, which in our view is flagging. Uh, this is a great opportunity to bring the CBD of Bathurst back to life. A six-level, one-stop, private integrated medical centre, something Bathurst currently doesn't enjoy. Look at all the people travelling to Orange every day for health reasons. It's just incredible. But the proposed location on Howick Street is being scrutinised by council tonight. Developers are seeking an exemption to the city's height restrictions. I would view that as being a green light 
for any other developer to start building high-rise towers throughout the CBD. There are concerns the building could also affect Bathurst's heritage. And you've changed it into an outer far, outer western suburb of Sydney. But those particular people are so far backward that I think they want to see horse troughs back outside the Westpac Bank. You know, we have to move on. Advocates at the proposed location say its presence would provide much needed foot traffic that would be supported by an adjoining five level car park. It won't just help the club, it'll help every business that's located in the Bathurst CBD. Others say patients would benefit being closer to the existing public hospital. If you co-locate these medical facilities next to each other, all you do is just transfer them either across a gantry or across the road. If Bathurst councillors grant the height exemption, the project will then go through to the development application stage. Ruben Spargo, 7 News.